You guys are so sweet. I'm, I'm glad that you have nothing better to do on a Thursday night than just come on in here and dream a little bit together. Uh, it is Thursday night, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I've been on this whirlwind trip through California, visiting uh, different schools, and of course I'm leaving tomorrow, so Biola is uh, the grand finale. I've been looking forward to being with y'all. I was at that little uh, Azusa Pacific this morning, but you know, nothing about that, but uh, no. I, I'm, I'm doing the work of reconciliation, you know what I mean? Um, but I am so excited to be here, it, just so you know how this evening's going to flow a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk for a bit and tell you some stories of, uh, from Philly and, and stuff, and then we're, we're going to open it up in, in 45 minutes or so for as much Q&A as feels right. Does that sound good? So I thought first we'd bust open the Word a little bit. There's a scripture I want to look at, and uh, it's meant a lot to me this year. Just let me set it up a little bit first, though, because i, I got to say one, one of the things I love about Jesus is his imagination. Uh, I mean, he's always um, uh, doing just beautiful, creative things, especially when he gets asked the big questions, you know, like uh, when the tax collectors come, <laughs> and they're like, do, do you all pay your taxes? And uh, Jesus tells them to go get a fish and it'll have a four drachma coin in its mouth. <laughs> I love that. I mean, like fish don't usually have coins in their mouth, you know, and um, I th it's awesome because I think he's kind of going, oh, Caesar can have his coins. I made the fish. What? You know, I, I, it's, it's beautiful. And he's, he's always doing that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, and in this particular passage in Luke chapter 7, uh, just to set the scene a little bit, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, has gotten into a little bit of trouble. And uh, he's uh, locked up in prison. He got in trouble with old King Herod. And so he's in jail. It's before he gets his head cut off. That's another day. But anyway, like he's there, and he sends his disciples. I'm sure, you know, he's hearing the stirrings in the land, and of course he's the one that was preparing the way. And, 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 um, and so he sends his disciples out to ask Jesus a very specific question. John tells his disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you the one that we've all been waiting for, or should we expect someone else? And that, that phrase, the one that we've been waiting for, was from the prophets like Isaiah that was, you know, to con connotate the, the Messiah, the anointed one of God that would come and set all things right, you know? And I think maybe John the Baptist was getting a little antsy at this point. <laughs> I mean, he's getting ready to get killed. He's like, uh, are you the one? Because, brother, I'm ready for the Messiah, you know? Uh, and so he sends them out and listen to what they say. It says this in, in Luke chapter 7, verse 20. When John's disciples came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the one that we've all been waiting for, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. He gave sight to the blind, and so he replied to John's disciples, go back and tell John what you see and what you hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. I love that answer because it's kind of like, you know, he, he, they, they come and they say, are you the one that we've all been waiting for? And he sort of throws the ball back in their court and he says, you tell me. Go tell John what you see and what you hear. It's kind of an invitation to read the trail of crumbs that are following Jesus. And that trail of crumbs were signs of liberation and redemption and good news and healing and restoration. And it's very typical of Jesus, it seems, that he, you know, as he's inviting them to, to read the signs, uh, Jesus doesn't walk around flaunting who he is. You know, I mean, you don't see him coming up to people like, hey, I'm the son of God in your name. You know, I, 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 but he invites everybody to follow and, and people begin to worship, not because he makes them, not because he forces them to, but because they can't help but worship. They discover that he's good, he's beautiful. And at the end of the day, um, one theologian said, what we can learn from the way that Jesus spreads the good news is that the gospel spreads best not through force, but through fascination. Isn't that beautiful? The gospel spreads best not through force, but through fascination. And it, it, it does cause me, you know, to, to ask the question, like, if people were to ask us, are you Christians? Do we have the integrity that we can answer in the same way 
Tell me what you see and what you hear. Is there anything that follows us that reminds people of that same goodness and, and, and healing? And uh, unfortunately, I think that, that many people who have experienced Christianity in the church have not felt the same things, that, that these, these beautiful things that follow Jesus. In fact, if you've seen this study uh, just a couple of years ago, the Barna Research Group did a study where they asked people outside the church, what are your perceptions of Christians? Have you seen this study? And, and uh, they, they, they interviewed people in almost every state. And the top three perceptions of Christians from folks outside the church is number one, Christians are anti-gay, anti-homosexual. Number two, Christians are judgmental. And number three, Christians are hypocrites. We got a little bit of an image crisis, you know, <laughs> and much of it's well-deserved. I mean, that's what people have seen and heard, and yet I'm pretty sure those aren't the first things that people thought of when they encountered Jesus. And, and, and it seems that those, you know, that, that should break our heart. And I, I remember at one point um, Gandhi uh, was asked, are you a Christian? And his response was, it was just beautiful. He said, oh, I love Jesus. I just wish the Christians took him more seriously. You know, and, and yet I'm, I'm so excited because I think today that there are Christians that are beginning to take the words of Jesus seriously. And we want a Christianity that looks like Jesus again. We want a church that reminds people of the goodness of God and has those same signs of healing behind them. And I, I don't know about you, but I grew up in, in East Tennessee, you know, in the Bible Belt, the Deep South. And uh, uh, there, we, we went to youth groups, you know. I mean, that's like what you do in East Tennessee. You go to youth group, you know. And we, we'd play games and whatnot. And um, we, we had one youth group that had a Velcro wall, which was cool. You, like put this sticky suit on, you run and jump and stick to the wall for Jesus, <sighs> you know. Um, but, you know, and, and I'm, I'm actually very, very thankful that it, I, I did have people that loved me in the church, you know, and I, I came to a realization that there's a God that loves me. And I, I gave my life to Jesus, you know, we, uh, we would come to the altar and, and, um, and give our lives to Jesus. In fact, because there not, wasn't a ton to do in East Tennessee, like it was the highlight of our year going to these Christian festivals. And we would go every summer and get born again again, you know. And uh, I must, it must have got born again like six or eight times. And it was awesome every time. If you haven't done it, highly recommend it. But, you know, there, there kind of comes a point where I started going, okay, there's got to be more to being a Christian than just getting born again again every year, you know, and there's got to be more than just believing all the right stuff. Um, don't get me wrong, I think what we believe is, is really, really important, but you know, I, I would come forward to the altar singing just as I am, and we would leave just as we were, and kind of live just as we always had, you know, and I, and, and I saw that, that the scriptures say even the demons believe, you know, it says that in Corinthians that we can, we can do all sorts of miracles and prophecies and speak in the tongues of men and of angels, and we can do all, we can have faith to move mountains, but if we don't have love, then it's nothing but an empty gong, and, 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 and I, I began to read the words of Jesus, and, and Jesus, you know, was always talking about the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God that Jesus talked about wasn't just something that we hope for when we die, but something that we're to bring on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? That, that, that I began to, to see that in the church, really, we were promising everybody life after death. And a lot of people were going, yeah, but is there life before death? You know, like, like doesn't your gospel have any good news and healing now? Like, and, and so, so, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm excited about, you know, the afterlife. We'll party like there's no tomorrow and there won't be, you know. But, but like that, that following J Jesus came not just to prepare us to die, but to teach us how to live, you know. And, and so I wanted to figure that out. And, and that took me up to Philadelphia. And I think where I really learned that wasn't just in the halls of my Christian college, though I went to a great school and I, I studied sociology. And, I, and, and, and yet it was when I began to go into the city and I began to, to hang out with folks that were homeless and, and that were hurting. And I, 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 I felt like the gospel come to life, you know. And, and to this day, I, I, I've learned more about God through the tears of homeless women than any systematic theology book has taught me. It's not to say don't read your systematic theology, you know. But, I, but that, that's, 
what happened to me, and, I, and, and in particular in 1995, while I was a student in college in the suburbs, there was a group of poor and homeless families in Philly. And these, these families were mostly mothers and children. Dozens of them had gotten together in the middle of, of, of a struggle for housing. And they looked around North Philly where we've got hundreds of abandoned houses and abandoned factories and, and, and all of this space. And, the, and yet there was a waiting list for housing. And they did something really courageous. These families decided to expose the struggle of homelessness and of, of homeless families and children, the fastest growing homeless population in the U.S. And they said, we, wanna, we want people to see that. And so they found this building that they could all move into. And incidentally, it wasn't just any building, but they picked an old abandoned Catholic cathedral and they moved into it and they started living there. And as they were living there, um, we saw in the newspaper the story. And uh, one of my buddies came into our college cafeteria and he threw down a newspaper and he said, you're not going to believe this, check it out. And the headline article said, Church Resurrected. And it was a story of how they had brought this abandoned building back to life. And, and as we read on, it was fascinating. And then it, it, the, the article ended by saying that the archdiocese, the, the head of the Catholic Church that owned the building, had given them an eviction notice. And if they weren't out within 48 hours, they could be arrested for trespassing on church property. <laughs> I don't know about you, but those are times where we kind of scratch our head and we're like, God, why don't you do something? And we kind of felt God say back, I did do something. I made you get out, you know. And so we like went down and we found those families that night. And we, we drove through the streets of North Philly and we found the cathedral. The families had hung a banner on the front of the cathedral that said, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? And it took us a minute to digest the truth of that. But we knocked on the doors and we entered into that struggle and it was the catalyst for, a, for an incredible student movement on our campus where many of us got involved in that. And, and uh, not only did we uh, be get, become friends and family with, with these, these women and children, but it was also a place where we began to look at scripture again and we saw Jesus not just as one who came to help the poor, but one who came as the poor, one who was born in the middle of a genocide and came from a town where they said nothing good could come, who knew suffering from the moment he entered this world until he died on the cross. And it was in there that, uh, I mean, all kinds of stuff happened. I can't tell you all the stories, but uh, it didn't end after 48 hours. In fact, uh, one, one interesting thing was that the media made it look like the church was kicking homeless people out, and that's because the church was kicking homeless people out, you know, and so um, they, they, but, uh, they, they brought in the fire marshal, and they said, well, well, we'll say that it's in the interest of the family's safety that, that they're, you know, it's, it's a fire hazard, and so we'll have the fire marshal get them out. And the night before the fire marshal was to come, there was a knock at the door at about midnight. And of course, we, we were there and, and a few of us got up and we, and we answered the door together and we saw outside a bunch of firefighters. And our, our, instinct, uh, our instinctive thought was, oh my gosh, they've come to evict them right now, you know, and it's the middle of the night, there's no media and all this and the kids are asleep. So we start talking a mile a minute. And we're like, hey, listen, can you please come back? We, we didn't know that you were going to come tonight, and uh, the kids are asleep, and it's just, you know, and, and uh, they said, no, 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 listen, listen. We're not here to kick you out. In fact, it's just the opposite. We know what's happening, and it's not right. We're here against orders, and we could get in really big trouble for being here, but we, we want to help you get ready for tomorrow because the fire marshal is going to come. And they took us to the fire department, and they helped us get smoke detectors, boxes of them, you know, and they helped us get exit signs and fire extinguishers, and we worked all night, you know. We got ready, and then the next day, the, the fire marshal came with the media and the archdiocese officials and the police, and they walked through the building, and he's like, I'm not going to kick them out. They're close enough to meeting fire standards. We're like, yes, Lord, you know. And, uh, uh, and it was in there, you know, that we, we began to, to, to worship. You know, we would have worship services in the old cathedral. In fact, we would climb up the bell tower and ring the bell, and neighbors started coming, you know. And, and, uh, and we started reading the book of Acts, where it says all of the believers were together, and they shared everything they had. No one claimed any of their possessions were their own. And it says, and there were no needy persons among them. They ended poverty. 
It was one of the signs of the birthday of the church because they figured out this, this incredible movement of, of loving our neighbor as ourself. And, and so it was there in that cathedral that we, we uh, some of us, I mean, we had all different experiences with the church. Some of my friends had been raised Catholic and they had terrible stories of that, some of them, and some had great stories. And other of my friends were, you know, we were raised evangelical and, and uh, you know, some called themselves recovering evangelicals and, you know, and it was all like we were all different. But what we decided was we're going to stop complaining about the church that we've experienced and work on becoming the church that we dream of. And I think it's the very thing that many of us are seeing today, that the, the church is in ruins. You know, I mean, there's, there's uh, things that we're not proud of. And yet, like, uh, we've got to be the change that we want to see in the church. And, and it's that which uh, uh, we thought when we were doing this that we were uh, pioneering it, you know, for the first time in hundreds of years. And, and then we looked around a little bit. <laughs> And we saw that, that every generation seems to have a reformation or a renewal or some sort of movement in the church. And as Phyllis Tickle, the church historian, says, uh, it seems every few hundred years the church has an identity crisis like we have right now. And she says, so we need to rethink what it means to be the church. And, and she said, uh, 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 we need a rummage sale so we can get rid of the clutter, you know, and we can cling to the treasures of our faith. And I, I think that's the same whisper that St. Clair and St. Francis heard in Assisi in the middle of the 13th century with all of the militarism and the materialism of Italy. They looked at the church and wept. And they said, no, God wants more. And Francis heard the whisper of God say, repair the ruins of my church. Of course, he was very simple-minded, so he literally like picked up bricks and started rebuilding that old San Damiano Cathedral, you know. But it's that whisper of repairing the church that I, I think many of us hear today. And, and as we think of that, it seems that it's important to, um, to, to think of how we put our faith, the things that we believe, into action. Because the great challenge today is not just right thinking, but right living. And I think in, in the evangelical church, what we've had is we've been in, uh, uh, very driven to, to um, make convert, you know, converts. And, just, and, and we ended up with a language that's just based on believing. You know, like, is your mother a believer? And so it's as if we think that Christianity is just something we believe and not uh, but we're sent in the world not to make believers but disciples right people that are formed into something different out of this world that we're living into different values and patterns from the world around us and you know in, in the end it's it's uh, beautiful and, and Jesus tells the story of all of the nations that are gathered before God you know and 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 uh, in Matthew 25, as we're, we're, we're separated into the sheep and the goats, you know, God asks us a question. And it's actually not a doctrinal test. Um, I mean, <laughs> some of us might hope it is. That would be real easy, right? If the question God asked us was, virgin birth, agree or disagree? <laughs> or strongly disagree, you know? <laughs> but the question we're asked is actually, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When I was sick, did you care for me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? Uh, our faith is worked out in, in, in love and compassion for other people. And so a few years ago, what we did was we gathered a bunch of folks together to dream together, like theologians, old folks, young folks, people, all different uh, streams of Christianity. And we said, let's identify some of the marks of what it means to be a Christian disciple today. And I thought as we open up for conversation in a minute, I would throw some of those out. And the, and the first thing that we identified is that, that we Christians have a strange way of looking at suffering. That suffering is not something that we are to uh, move away from. But as people following the incarnation of Jesus, that suffering is something that we are entering into. That we are to not move away from the neighborhoods where there's high crime, but we're to move into them. We're to be people that practice resurrection and that take our gifts into some of the most forsaken corners of the world. And that's a strange way of thinking. It's very countercultural. You know, I, I think that uh, w one of my colleagues at Eastern um, came up to one of my profs, and she was an education major. 
And she came up to, to my prof kind of bragging uh, that, that she had applied to some of the best suburban schools, some of the highest paying jobs, you know, and, and the most prestigious schools in the suburbs. And, and she said uh, this one job that she had really wanted, she said there were 300 applicants for the job. And she said, and out of all 300, I got the job. And I remember my prof looked at her and he said, why would you take that job? There's 299 other people that are waiting in line for that job. You're one of the best teachers that we have. You should be going to some of the toughest schools in the city that are dying for good teachers, you know? Like, that's different, you know? Like, that's a, it's a different way of thinking about our gifts, but it's when we take our gifts and our passions and we say, how can my gifts interact with the brokenness of our world? And, and something happens there, you know? Another one of my buddies uh, in college, he, he went out of Eastern and went to Harvard. One of the, the um, I mean, he was just stellar student at Harvard Law School, came out of Harvard. Uh, he's African-American, and so coming out of Harvard Law, he could pretty much go anywhere and name his salary. But he said, you know what? I want to be a different kind of lawyer. And uh, he, he looked at the criminal justice system and he said, in many places, we're not just locking up guilty people, but we're locking up poor folks and people of color that can't afford good lawyers. So I want to be their lawyer and I'll do it for free if I have to. Like, that's different, you know. And I think one of the biggest questions that, that you can be asking is not just, am I going to be a doctor or a lawyer, but what kind of doctor or lawyer am I going to be? How, how can I, I use my gifts in a way that's meaningful for the kingdom of God on this earth? And, uh, you know, I, besides, I, I'm not even sure exactly what my occupation is now. I got invited back to my high school for this, you know, reunion. I'm old now. And, uh, and um, and, and they, I had to fill out this survey, and so I, I, I'm sitting here thinking, like, okay, one of the, the blanks was occupation. I'm like, oh, God, trick question. You know, um, what, what do I do? You know, and I, I think, well, I'm, I'm trying to love God and love people, so I wrote in lover. And, um, <laughs> and uh, now I'm listed as a professional lover in our alumni book. <laughs> I won't say more about it, but you know, I, I, but I think that's like, that's what we're made for. Everything else is, is to, all of our gifts and our occupations are to serve this love of our God and of our neighbor and to, to see what can move us closer to that. And more important than what we're going to do when we grow up is who we are becoming. So next, uh, one of the things that we identified is that as a church and as a people of God, we have a strange way of looking at economics. That in the early church, one of the marks of rebirth was redistribution of your resources. That John the Baptist was preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is here. But he also said, and if you've got two tunics, give one away. And in the early church, we see this economy that's based in love, that the offerings were put at the apostles' feet and distributed to folks as they had need. And, and, and it was an economy of love, you know. And I, I think, like, even when we started our community, we're like, that's what we want, you know. So we, we put all of our money together and we bought a house. Um, you can buy a house in my neighborhood for, like, 30000 So <laughs> So everybody wants to move out now, sweet. You know, but um, like, we put our money together bought a house, and we saw that we could live really sustainably off of about $200 a month per person. And part of the reason for that was that we didn't all have a car. We had one car that 10 of us would share. You know, we, had, we, had, uh, we would share a washer and dryer. We shared a house. We shared, so we were able, rather than figure out how do we accumulate more, we, we, we were asking how, how can we live off less. And then I had friends that were able to pay tens of thousands of dollars worth of debt off because they're living off $200 a month. You know, and so there's, there's this beautiful abundance that happens when, when we share our economics together. And it's not just so that we can have cheap rent, you know, but I think part of the, the reason is so that we can free our, our, our gifts up to, to be a part of, of uh, um, you know, meeting the needs of others. And there's a great story of this. When I, uh, a lot of us, you know, we get asked, well, what do you do about health care, you know? And my answer used to be, I call my mom, you know, but that doesn't really work. So, like, like you, you think we've got to build some alternatives to this. And there's a group of Christians that I bumped into that many of them were, were in poverty and didn't have adequate health care, like 47 million people in this country. 
And, and as they were struggling together, they said, you know what, we hope that Washington does something, but we can't wait on Washington to do something. We're going to start now in, in, in meeting each other's needs. So what they did was uh, this just a few hundred people, they would put out a newsletter every month of who's in the hospital, and they would be praying for each other. And then they would put some flesh on the prayers by passing the hat, and they put their money together. And then they would use that money to meet the medical bills of the community. And the vision spread so beautifully. God just blessed it that they ended up um, continuing to, sp to spread. And now there's 20,000 people. It started just as a couple hundred. Now there's 20,000 of us. Every month we get a newsletter of who's in the hospital. We're praying for each other. And then we put our money together. And over the last 20 years, we've met over $500 million in medical bills. I mean, it's half a billion dollars, you know. It, it, we're doing about $12 million a year in bill sharing for each other. And, and it doesn't solve the problem for the $47 million. It certainly doesn't get Washington off the hook. But I think what it is is saying the church can be the church. We don't just have to wait on politicians to solve everything. Amen? So this economic sharing, I think we need that imagination. You know, and everywhere, once in a while, people get a little, whoa, you know. This sounds like communism. I, I get so tired of that because what we're talking about in the early church is an economy that's not a system. It's not a socialism or a communism. It's no ism. It's an economy based on the love of our neighbor as ourself. And that means another person's suffering is my suffering. If I have more than I need while someone else has less than I've stolen from them, that we are to hold our possessions in that sort of recklessness of God's economy that is so much that one person should not be suffering while another has more than they need. And it's that which uh, I, I like to say, if we really discover God's economy of loving our neighbor as ourself, then capitalism as we have it won't be possible and Marxism won't be necessary. That is, it's that economy that's, that's rooted in a love of neighbor so next, we, we began to see that, uh, that as Christians, we have a strange way of looking at sex. And like, uh, I, I think that a lot of us, we grow up with this idea that you've just got to get married, you know? And you go to like singles groups, and they're just places where you hook up, right? I mean, let's be honest. You know, so like, like there's not an appreciation of singleness. But in the kingdom of God, it seems that there's a different understanding of sexuality where, where we are uh, first and foremost to be lovers of God, that that is what we're made for, you know? And I mean, just read Hosea. And, and, and that, that we, we should shouldn't just assume that everybody's got to grow up. I mean, I go home, people are like, you met anybody yet? You know, you just keep praying. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I remember hearing a pastor preach a sermon where he held a picture of a husband and wife and two kids and prayed for all of the children of the church to find the one that God had for them. That is terrible theology. You know, I mean, you look at folks like Mother Teresa and you don't go, Oh, poor thing. If she had only met her husband, you know. <laughs> but, but singleness is a, is a way that has freed people up to pursue the kingdom of God with a recklessness and a single-mindedness. So, uh, you know, if you get married, fantastic. If God has you to be single, then praise God, you know. Oh, the single lady. You know what I mean? So like that, that's what we're talking about. So one of my mentors, one of my mentors, he says, he says, our, we, we have to understand that our deepest hunger is to love and to be loved. It's not for sex. And so you can live without sex if you have love. But we can't live without love. So we've got to figure out ways of creating community where people can love and be loved. And then the other things get a little bit easier. Well, I was going to talk about more, but I want to talk with you. Let me, let me just say that, 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 uh, that we identified like 12 different ones, and I, I got to preaching. So the, the one other thing I would say is that, that as Christians, we, we have a strange way of looking at evil and of violence in the world. And one of the things that's happened in Philadelphia is we got one of uh, the highest homicide rates that we've ever had. And just two weeks ago, I had a a kid that was killed right in front of our house. And he was a 248th homicide this year in Philly. 
And so we're trying to do a lot of work, you know, to teach kids not to hit each other, to teach kids that it's more courageous to love your enemy than to hate them. And, and all of this rooted in Jesus is love on the cross. And they're beginning to get it, some of them. One, one kid came home, Rolando, and he said, he was telling me about all these kids that were picking on him in school. And I said, Rolando, you know what that means? I said, it means you've got to work so much harder to be their friend. Sit with them at the, at the lunchroom table, even if they make fun of you. Try to be their friend. Maybe they've only had people beat them up their whole life. And they don't know what it's like to take care of someone. And Rolando said, oh, Shane, love is so hard. <laughs> And that's the love that Dostoevsky spoke of when he said the love that we're talking about is not the sentimental love of story tales. And, and uh, th this is the love that keeps you up at night. This is the love that's harsh and dreadful, that breaks our heart and that aches inside of us. It's that love which we see in Jesus. And it's that love, you know, that I think we see exemplified in, in so many of, of the, the, the great heroes of our faith, you know, and, and, and the martyrs and those who have, have, have died and suffered for Jesus. It's, it's a love of enemy that, that says, you can, you can hurt me and I will still love you. You can put me in jail and I will still love you. And it's that love, as the early Christians said, that the real grace it dulls the executioner's sword, that we wear evil down with love. And it's that which Dr. Martin Luther King talked about. And he also said that I've told the kids in the ghettos that violence won't solve their problems. But then they ask me, and rightly so, why does our government use massive doses of violence to try to bring about the change that it wants to see in the world? And Dr. King said, I knew that I could no longer speak against the violence of the ghettos without also speaking against the violence of my government. Of course, he got killed shortly after that. And it wasn't a popular message, but it, it seems that, that that message was something that, that I really began to connect to, and I was able to really be commissioned by my neighborhood to go to Iraq. And as some of you know, I was in Iraq in March of 2003 as a Christian peacemaker because what I began to see was that what's at stake in the world right now is not just the reputation of America, but what's at stake is the reputation of the gospel and what Jesus really lived and died and teaches in this message that if we pick up the sword, we die by the sword. That if our enemy is hungry, then we're to feed them. It's a radical, crazy love that makes no sort of sense to the logic of this world. And it's that which I went to Iraq and I was able to be with families. And I was able to go to worship services with Christians all over Iraq. And there was one worship service. It was, it was so powerful. I mean, we, we sang Amazing Grace in Arabic. And there were thousands of Christians from all over the Middle East that had come together. So many that they couldn't even get in the building, so they were in the streets holding candles. And then the bishop stood up on the altar, and they read a statement from the Christian church. All of the bishops were up there, and they said, this statement said uh, to Muslim people, it was, it was addressed to Muslim people, and it said, we believe that you are created from the same dirt of this earth that God breathed life into that we come from the same dysfunctional family of Abraham and Sarah, and we want you to know that we love you. And then they led us to the cross, and they said, this cross doesn't make any sense to the smarts of smart bombs or the patterns of this world, but this cross teaches us to love those who hate us. And I was so moved. I was just weeping all over myself, you know. And I ended up going up to the bishop afterwards, and I, I talked with him. And, and I said to this bishop uh, something that was, I didn't know how ignorant it was at the time, but I said, um, Bishop, I can't, this is so powerful. I said, I, I can't believe that there's so many Christians in Iraq. And he said, yes, son, this is where Christianity started. <laughs> He said, that's the Tigris River, and that's the Euphrates. Have you heard of them? And he said, you go back, and you, he said, you, you tell the church in America that they didn't invent Christianity. They only domesticated it. And you tell them that we are praying for them to be a people that are after the Prince of Peace and embodying that love. 
So I'm so excited today. You know, I, I think that there's so much that's changing around the world. You know, I've been in um, a dozen or so different countries this year and just seeing God move everywhere. And really what it's about is about people like, like you and I that are trying to get back to Jesus again and trying to say we want our faith to be conformed not to the patterns of this world, but to the patterns of God's upside-down kingdom and lived after this lover Jesus and everything that we are to be submitted to him. And in the end, it's not so that people see the great things that we do and think that we're fantastic or something, but all that we're doing is to try to embody God's love so that people can see it and touch it and taste it. And unfortunately, I think one of the greatest barriers to Christ has often been Christians who have so much to say with our mouths and so little of God's goodness to show with our lives. And so we want that again, don't we? And it's that which, you know, I think we have to be careful not to think that it's about us. You know, one preacher to he told this real well. He said, yeah, sometimes we, we get the narcissistic complex that maybe the donkey had that rode Jesus into Passover. You know, this donkey that's riding Jesus in and people are lying in the streets, you know. And he said, that donkey might have started to think a little something about himself, you know. That donkey's walking along, hearing all the hosannas and been like... That's not my name, but, uh, you know, and uh, sorry, like strutting his stuff a little bit. And, uh, and this preacher said, but we've got to remember that it's not about the donkey. It's about the one who rode the donkey. We're just the jackasses that get to bring Jesus in, you know. So, but what a beautiful thing it is. What a beautiful thing it is that we get to carry such precious cargo and that for some strange reason, the God of the universe does not want to change the world without us. That the invitation that we have is to join God's movement in the world. And I really am convinced that a generation from now, when people hear the word Christian, the first things that come to mind won't be anti-gay, judgmental, and hypocritical, but they will be things like peace, mercy, justice, and compassion. Amen. May it be so. Let's pray together and then we'll talk. Spirit of the living God, fall on us. Mold us into new creations. Give us imagination with the way that we live. That we might not conform to the patterns of this world, but that we might be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Give us a new way of thinking about our lives and our vocations. Teach us what it means to be your church. God, we pray that all that you are would take root in us, that the fruits of the Spirit would so be inside of us that everyone we come in contact with would feel the goodness of your love, that they would feel love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and all of the things that you are. In the name of Jesus, amen.